Chapter 11, Infinite Sequences and Series. Section 11.1, .1, Sequences. A sequence can be thought of as a list of numbers written in a definite order. A1, A2, A3, A4, and so on. We get to AN and then we keep going, potentially. The number A1 is called the first term, A2 is the second term, and in general, AN is the nth term. A sequence can also be defined as a function whose domain is the set of positive integers. However, we usually write a n instead of the function notation f of n for the value of the function at the number n. So you can think of numbers instead of uh, f of x, where x was any real number. If you think of a n as f of n, then each of the inputs is only an integer. So the sequence a1, a2, a3 is also denoted by this notation. We just use curly braces on the left and right, or we use this notation to show that it starts at one and keeps going forever. So as an example, some sequences can be defined by giving a formula for the nth term. In the following examples, we give three descriptions of the sequence, one by using the preceding notation, another by using the defining formula, and the third by writing out the terms of the sequence n doesn't have to start at 1 in general. So in this case, we do start at 1, and we keep going forever, and each of the terms is represented by n over n plus 1. So that means that the first term is when you plug in 1, you get 1 over 1 plus 1 is a half, and then 2 over 2 plus 1 is 2 thirds, and so on. So all three of these represent the same sequence. For our next sequence, we have uh, minus 1 to the n times n plus 1 over 3 to the n. So what this minus 1 to the n does is it alternates the sign of each of the terms. Because if n equals 1, then minus 1 is just minus 1. But if n equals 2 or any other even number, then minus 1 times minus 1 becomes a positive. So that means that for every single odd term in this sequence, we have a negative. And for every single even term, we have a positive, all because of this guy. And then the rest of it is similar to the previous example. You just you plug in, and then you know you see what term you get. In this example, we start at three. So the first term is uh, three minus three. When you, then you take the square root, so you get zero. Notice it doesn't make sense to start the sequence below three because then you're taking the square root of a negative number. In our uh, next example, we have cosine n pi over 6, and each of these terms uh, starts at 0. Well, not each of them, but the first term starts at n equals 0. So we plug that in, we see what numbers we get. Let's find a formula for the general term a n of the sequence given over here. So we'll assume that the pattern of the first few terms continues. So let's look at what a1 is. According to our uh, list, it's 3 fifths. A2 is negative 4 over 25. A3 is 5 over 125. A4 is negative 6 over 625. And A5 is 7 over 3125. And the reason why I wrote out each of these explicitly with the a's is because we need to somehow figure out a pattern that relates the numerator, denominator, and the term number. So when we have 1, we have 3 in the numerator. When we have 2, we have 4. 3, we have 5. 4, we have 6. And 5, we have 7. So that means that in the numerator, it looks like we have an n plus 2. Whatever number n is for a n, we just add 2 to it. In the denominator, the pattern looks like it's 5, 25, 125, 625. So 5 is 5 to the 1. Then 25 is 5 squared. 125 is 5 cubed. So it looks like it's just 5 to the n in the denominator. Then we only have to worry about the sign. In example b, in the first example, we had the sign alternating also. But in that example, the first term had a negative and the second term had a positive. In this example, the first term is positive and the second term is negative. So instead of doing minus 1 to the n, I have to shift it a little bit to make sure that the 
first term becomes positive. So I'll let uh, minus 1 be to the n minus 1 power. By adjusting it, if I plug in 1, I get minus 1 to the 0, which is positive. If I plug in 2, I get 2 minus 1, and which is going to be just 1, so that'll be negative for this guy. And if I plug in 3, then it becomes positive again, because this becomes a 2, and so on like that. You could also just write n plus 1 instead of n minus 1, and you get the exact same effect. It doesn't make a difference. So let's let this be our a n. And that's a general term for the sequence. Here are some sequences that don't have a simple defining equation. The sequence pn, where pn is the population of the world as of January 1st in the year n. And if we let an be the digit in the nth decimal place of the number e, then an is a well-defined sequence whose first few terms are over here. Number e is 2.718, etc. So this is just the 0.718. You just take all of those digits and throw them into a sequence. Then we have the Fibonacci sequence, which we define recursively by saying that the first two um, numbers in the sequence are 1. And then after that, every single term is the sum of the two previous ones. So that means fn is our current term. Fn minus 1 is the term that comes before that term, and Fn minus 2 is two terms back. So you take the previous term, and you take the term previous to that, you add it together, and that gives you the current term. So 1 plus 1 gives you 2, 2 plus 1 gives you 3, 3 plus 2 gives you 5, and so on. The sequence apparently arose in the 13th century Italian mathematician known as Fibonacci solved the problem concerning the breeding of rabbits. I don't know, it's probably on Wikipedia or something. A sequence a n has the limit l, and we write the limit of a n equals l, or a n tends to l as l tends to infinity, if we can make the terms a n as close to l as we like by taking n sufficiently large. So this is pretty much the same as the definition for a limit that we thought of when we just thought of limits of functions in general, which makes sense it should be similar because a n is basically f n, but with integer inputs. So if this limit exists, we say the sequence converges, or is convergent. Otherwise, we say the sequence diverges, or is divergent. Now we have a precise definition for the limit of the sequence. A sequence has the limit l, and we write the limit of an equals l, or an tends l is l tends to infinity, if for every epsilon there is a corresponding integer n, such that if n is bigger than n, then the difference between a and n the limit is less than epsilon. So what we're saying is that if the limit exists, then you're able to go above some certain number and make your function arbitrarily close to your limit. In this case, your sequence arbitrarily close to your limit. So that means that you can say, okay, I want you to get within five of the limit. And you'll say, okay, fine, just you know, look at the sequence far enough along that it'll be close enough to five. Far enough along means you'll be able to actually find some n. If the limit of a function is l, and fn is equal to an, as we said we could write it, then the limit of an is that limit l. So what we're saying is, if we have a sequence, which can be written as a function over integers, and if there's a corresponding function over real numbers that we know of, then we can look at the limit of that function and that'll be the limit of the sequence. You have to be very careful here though, because very often we'll have sequences that do not have functions that correspond to them. We'll only have this fn, we won't have a matching fx. But in, otherwise it's pretty useful. Lastly, uh, the limit of a n equals infinity means that for every positive number n, there's an integer n such that if n is bigger than n, then a n is bigger than m. So that means if we go far enough along, then we'll be uh, bigger than every single possible number we can think of. We can just always, you know, name a positive number, and I'll say, okay, just go this far along, and then you'll be bigger than that number. So we're saying this thing grows arbitrarily large. Similar to um, limits in general, we have limit laws for sequences. So if we have convergent sequences, then the limit of the sum is the sum of the limits, exactly as we want. Same for differences. 
if we have the limit of a constant times a term, we can pull out the constant, put it over there outside, and the limit of a constant is just itself. The limit of a product is the product of the limits, the limit of a quotient is the quotient of the limits, provided the denominator limit is not zero. The limit of a power is the power of the limit, provided that you know you have positive power and your sequence is positive because you don't want to try taking a root of a negative. Then we also have the squeeze theorem for sequences, just like we had it for limits. If um, we have sequences a and b and cn, and bn is sandwiched in between a and cn, and we have the limit of this guy equals the limit of this guy, then the one in between must have a matching limit. Next up, we have a less uh, usual theorem. This one's more unique to limits, so let's take a look at this one. If the limit of the absolute value of a sequence is zero, then the limit of the sequence itself without the absolute value must also be zero. So this one we're going to use kind of frequently. Let's prove it. Since the limit of the... We're, we're, let's assume that the limit of the absolute value is uh, zero. We'll show that this has to follow. So we're assuming right now that this is true. Then we can write the limit of minus times that. And we can pull out the minus. So that's just minus the limit, which is also going to be zero. So now we can use the squeeze theorem. Because we have the limit of this thing is zero, we have the limit of this thing is zero, and an is in between minus the absolute value and the absolute value. So that forces an to also be uh, have a limit of zero. Let's do some examples now of finding limits of sequences. So how about we take the limit of n over n plus 1 as n tends to infinity. So we'll rewrite it. And we can use the same strategy that we used when we were evaluating limits at infinity over functions over real numbers, where we just take the limit and we divide the um, terms in the numerator and denominator so that we can get um, fractions. That way we can just look at the limits of those fractions and see that they're zero. So I mean, we'll divide the top and bottom by n. So that means the n's divide out and give us 1's. And the 1 gives us a 1 over n. Because we know how to get the limit of 1. I can use one of our limit properties to just push the limit into the numerator and denominator and then separate it between the sum. So I get the limit of 1 plus the limit of 1 over n. And the idea here is that the limit of 1 over n as n tends to infinity is the same as the limit of 1 over x as x tends to infinity, because that's a matching function, 1 over x to 1 over n. So limit of 1 over x as x tends to infinity was 0. Limit of 1 is obviously just 1. So this becomes 1 over 1 plus 0, which is 1. Remember, if the denominator is getting super, 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 super big, then the fraction is getting super, super, super small. So it makes sense that it should go to zero. Is the sequence a n equals n over square root of 10 plus n convergent or divergent? Well, let's see. We've got the limit of n over the square root of 10 plus n. And that's going to be equal to the limit of n divided by n, which is 1, over square root of 10 divided by n squared. Because in order to fit um, dividing by n inside the square root, we'll divide by the square root of n squared. That's the same thing as dividing by n. So then n divided by n squared is just 1 over n. So now let's see, we've got n tending towards infinity. So that means that this thing tends to zero and this thing tends to zero. So then our denominator in general tends to zero. If our denominator tends to zero, then our, fun our limit tends to infinity. Because one divided by a very, very small number is a very, very big number just like when we looked at limits of uh, functions of real numbers.
So this implies that our sequence An is divergent because the limit does not exist. Okay, how about the limit of ln n over n? Well, we have a matching function. f of x is ln x over x is a function over real numbers. So let's get the limit of that. Well, the limit of ln x over x can be evaluated using L'Hopital's rule because this is indeterminate. So the foam infinity over infinity. So we get the derivative of the numerator is 1 over x. Derivative of the denominator is 1. So this is the limit of 1 over x as x tends to infinity, which is 0, as we've said. So that implies that the matching limit for f of n, or a n, is just ln of n, and I'll separate it a little bit, over n. And that's just going to be 0. Let's determine whether the sequence a n equals minus 1 to the n is convergent or divergent. So let's write out a couple terms. If we plug in n equals 1, because we'll, we assume, unless we're told otherwise, that we're starting at 1. So then we get minus 1 to the 1 is minus 1. Minus 1 squared is 1. Minus 1 to the third is minus 1. To the fourth is 1 to the fifth is minus one, to the sixth is one, and so on. So it uh, looks like this thing oscillates between minus one and one. It never actually approaches any kind of specific value. It just keeps flipping back and forth between minus 1 and 1. It doesn't approach minus 1 because the terms don't level off there. It doesn't approach 1 because the terms don't stay there. So this means the limit does not exist. We can't just give this thing two limits. So I'll write that the limit does not exist, DNE, similar to the way that we did it for limits of functions over real numbers. And we can say then that the sequence, because the limit doesn't exist, is divergent. If you wanted to, you could also graph the sequence. So here's a n, or f of n, if you like. Here's 1, here's minus 1. And I'll put in a bunch of terms. So let's say here's one, two, three, four, and so on. So then here's minus one, here's one, minus one, one, minus one, and so on. Notice that it just goes back and forth, back and forth, back and forth. It never approaches any specific number. It's like trying to take the limit of a trig function or trying to take the limit of sine of, or cosine. So if this thing, if this limit actually existed, we would expect that the uh, numbers would converge let me, over there to zero. Or if it converged to one, we would expect the numbers to start clumping around to one. Or if it converged to minus one, we would expect the numbers to start clumping to minus one. But they don't. They just completely vary back and forth between these guys. Let's evaluate the limit of minus 1 to the n over n if it exists. So a slightly different limit. So how about we try to take advantage of our absolute value theorem. Let's take the uh, limit of the absolute value of this guy. So that'll be the limit of the absolute value of minus 1 to the n over n. And that way we can forget about our negative because when we take the absolute value of minus 1 to the n, if it's 1 it stays 1 and if it's minus 1 it becomes positive 1 so that's just 1 over n. And we already know that limit is 0. Since we have our theorem that if the 
limit of the absolute value of a n is zero, then a n is zero. This implies that the limit of minus one to the n without the absolute value over n must also be zero. For our next theorem, if the limit of a n is l and the function f is continuous at l, then the limit of the uh, function evaluated at a n is equal to f of l. What we're saying is we have the limit on the outside of the function. We can pass the limit inside to put the limit of a n inside of f, and the limit of a n becomes l. So let's prove this really quick. This is where our precise definition of limits comes in handy. So we choose a particular n, say n naught, by the definition of a limit of a sequence, given an epsilon 1 greater than 0, there exists an integer n such that a n naught, whatever term we picked, will be arbitrarily close to our limit, or it'll be within um, epsilon 1 of our limit for n naught bigger than some number n. Similarly, we can use the definition of continuity to say that um, the limit of f exists at L, so for epsilon 2 there exists an epsilon 1, such that if this thing is less than epsilon 1, then that'll force f of that to be within f of L. That's just the definition of continuity. So that means that we now have that this thing implies this thing which is the definition of this limit existing in the first place. So we've proved it. Let's now find the limit of the sine of pi over n as n tends to infinity. So we'll take sine of pi over n and we will pass through the limit. So we put it inside now using our theorem and we just get what well, the limit of pi over n is just like the limit of 1 over n it doesn't matter what we have in our numerator the denominator is going to get so big it's going to eclipse it completely so that's just 0 so this is the sine of 0 which is 0 Let's now discuss the convergence of the sequence a n equals n factorial over n to the n, where n factorial is 1 times 2 times 3, and so on, until you get to n. So we're tempted over here to find a matching function over real numbers and use uh, L'Hopital's rule. But there is no continuous function over real numbers for this because this is n factorial, it's only defined over integers. So we can't use L'Hopital. Instead, we'll have to get a little bit more creative. How about we look at the first few terms in the general term? So we have a1 is equal to 1 factorial, which is 1, over 1 to the 1, so that's just 1. a2 is 1 times 2 over 2 times 2, so it's 2 over 4. a3 is 1 times 2 times 3 over 3 times 3 times 3. So 6 over 27. So if I look at a n in general, that's 1 times 2 times 3 times all the way until you get to n. And on the denominator, we have n times n times n and so on until we get to n. So it looks like as time goes on, our denominator completely eclipses our numerator. It seems like uh, if you go from like 1 to half and so on, the denominator is going to keep getting really big because it's all n's, but the numerator will be keeping it smaller because of all these earlier terms in there. So it looks like we should have that this thing is going to 0. Let's see if we can prove that, or at least justify it somehow. So we have a n equals 1 over n, I can factor that out, and I'm left with 2 times 3 times oh, everything left up until n. 
Mm, I'll put one more in over there. So then this entire thing over here is smaller than one because one would be if these were all n's, but these are smaller than n because n is the number that comes after the all these numbers at the beginning. So this is some fraction smaller than one. So this is one over n over here. So this entire thing is smaller than one over n. A n is also starting at um, one, starting positive and decreasing. So and all of the n's we're plugging in are starting at 1, so we got no negatives, so that means that this thing, a n, is between 0 and 1 over n. It's always going to be smaller than 1 over n because this is a fraction smaller than 1 multiplying by 1 over n, and it's always bigger than 0 because we're starting at 1. So we already know that 1 over n tends to 0 as n tends to infinity. So that means that a n is sandwiched between the limit of zero and the limit of another limit of zero. So that means that the limit of a n must be zero. And we do that using the squeeze theorem. How about uh, r to the n in general? Well, we know from uh, when we did uh, these limits of exponential functions in section 2.6 that if we look at the limit of uh, a to the x as um, x goes to infinity, then if a is any number bigger than one, like two to the you know to the three to the four to the five, whatever, it just gets so big. But if that a was a fraction, or if this r is a fraction that's uh, between 0 and 1, then we just keep multiplying by the fraction, it just gets smaller and smaller and smaller, and it goes to 0. So we have two cases right off the bat. It either equals infinity, if r is bigger than 1, or it equals 0 if r is between 0 and 1. So let's investigate the other cases. How about if r equals 1? So if r equals 1, then we're looking at the limit of 1 to the n. Anything raised to the 1 is just 1, so this is the limit of 1, which is 1. And similarly, let's look at the case where we're equal to 0. So then we have 0 to the n, which is just 0. So how about we investigate the case where r is negative? How about if it goes um, from minus 1 to 0? Well, how about I just take the absolute value everywhere over here? This is the same exact thing as saying that the absolute value of r is smaller than 1. If r is bigger than minus 1, that means that the absolute value of r must be smaller than 1. So this means that we can look at the limit of the absolute value of r to the n, which is the limit of the absolute value of r to the n. And we already know that that's zero by this case right over, oops, the second case right over here. Because absolute value of r is just some value between zero and one. So this is zero. And since the absolute value of a n is zero, that means that a n is zero. So that means that the limit of r to the n is zero when r is between minus 1 and 0. So we have one last case to consider, and that's when r is less than or equal to negative 1.
But if r is less than or equal to negative 1, well, let's say r is equal to minus 1, right? Then it's just minus 1 to the n. We already know that diverges by example 7 because it oscillates back and forth between minus 1 and 1. If it was minus 2 to the n, it would still oscillate. It would just oscillate even more. Instead of looking like uh, it did in example 7, it would just expand outwards because the numbers keep getting bigger, but then we get also larger negative. So it kind of like almost oscillates in an even worse fashion. So this means that for any negative number less than or equal to 1, we have r to the n diverging, similar to example 7. sequence a n is called increasing if a n is less than a n plus 1 for all n greater than or equal to 1. So we're saying that each term a n is less than a n plus 1, which is the term that comes next. So the uh, terms are the terms that come next are bigger than each term that came before. So it's increasing, it's going up. It's called decreasing if a n is greater than a n plus 1. So that means that the previous term was the bigger one. So the next term, a n plus 1, is smaller for each of these terms. And then we call a sequence monotonic if it's either one of these increasing or decreasing. So let's look at the sequence 3 over n plus 5. Well, we have 3 over n plus 5. That's got to be bigger than 3 over n plus 6. But 3 over n plus 6 is just 3 over n plus 1 plus 5, which is the next term. It should make sense that the bigger we make our denominator, the smaller the fraction gets. So that means that this thing is, uh, each of these terms, a n, are bigger than each of the terms that come next. In other words, the term that comes next is always going to be smaller. So that means that our sequence is decreasing. OK, how about the sequence a n equals n over n squared plus 1? Well, let's look at the next term and see if it's bigger or smaller. So the next term would be if we plugged in n plus 1 instead of n. So we have n plus 1 over n plus 1 squared plus 1. We should place n with n plus 1. And we want to see if that is smaller than n over n squared plus 1. We should hope it will be because this example says to show that. Well, this is the same exact thing as showing that n plus 1 times n squared plus 1 is smaller than n times n plus 1 squared plus 1, just by cross-multiplying. And that's the same thing as showing that n cubed plus n squared plus n plus 1 is less than n cubed plus 2n squared plus 2n by distributing. So we cancel out a bunch of terms on the left and right, and we get that this is the same thing as showing that 1 is less than n squared plus n. So if we can show this, then everything we did was completely reversible. So that'll lead us all the way back to what we wanted to show to begin with. But we are given that n is greater than or equal to 1. Our assumption is for all these sequences, we start at 1 unless told otherwise. So that means that n squared is some number greater than or equal to 1 plus another number greater than or equal to 1. That's got to be greater than 1. So that means that a n plus 1 is indeed smaller than a n. We get that this must be true.
and that means that our sequence is decreasing. Okay, this is not the only possible way you could have done this problem. In fact, here's an alternative. You could have looked at a corresponding function. Say you wanted to look at the function fx equals x over x squared plus 1. Well, then you could take the derivative. f prime of x is equal to, by the quotient rule, x squared plus 1 minus 2x squared over x squared plus 1 squared. And that's equal to 1 minus x squared over x squared plus 1 squared. And that's going to be negative, provided that this guy is bigger than 1. So that's negative when x squared is bigger than 1, which is the same as it be negative when x is bigger than 1. So that means that f is a decreasing function, provided that we're on the interval from 1 to infinity. So that means that our corresponding fn must be bigger than fn plus 1. Our fn must also be decreasing. So if you like taking derivatives and looking at um, where they're negative or positive, then that's an alternative sometimes to see whether sequences are decreasing or increasing, whether they're monotonic, provided that you could find a matching function. A sequence a n is bounded above if there is a number m such that a n is less than or equal to m for all n greater than or equal to 1. So that means that we've got like a bunch of sequence, whatever it is, a bunch of terms. There's some number that they never go past above. So similarly, if there is a number that they never go below, then it's bounded by below. If it's bounded above and below, then we say the sequence is bounded. So then we have a theorem that takes advantage of this definition, our monotonic sequence theorem. Every bounded monotonic sequence is convergent. So if it's increasing and bounded, or if it's decreasing and bounded, it must converge. So let's investigate the sequence an defined by the occurrence relation, where we're given that an sorry we're given that a one is two, but we're given that the next term an plus one is equal to half of the previous term plus 6. So we're not given an explicit formula for a n in terms of n where we can just plug it in. We have to keep computing the next term over and over. So it's a little bit harder. We can't just take the limit of this because we'd have to take the limit of a n, which we don't know to begin with. So let's see if we can, um, how about use the monotonic sequence theorem. If we can show that this thing is bounded and monotonic, then it must converge to some limit. That won't tell us what the limit is, but then we could probably figure out the limit if we know it at least exists. So in order to show that this thing is bounded and come up with some sort of candidate for a potential limit, let's investigate the first couple terms. So let's look at what uh, a1 is. Well, that's 2. They gave it to us. Then a2 the next term is half of the previous term plus 6. So that's half of 2 plus 6, which is 4. Then a3 is half of the previous term, which is 4 now, plus 6. So that's 5. a4 is going to be half of 5 plus 6, which is 5.5. And then a5 is going to be 5.75. a6 is 5.875. a7 is 5.975. And then a8 is 
and how about we stop at a nine? That will be 5.984375. So it looks like we're getting closer and closer to six. So it looks like this thing is going to be bounded by six, and we start at two. So it looks like this thing is increasing. So how about we show that this thing is increasing, and we'll show that it's bounded by six, and that'll show the limit exists. And then we'll use the fact that the limit exists to show that the limit is actually six. So in order to show that this thing is increasing, how about we use induction? So we want to show that an plus one is bigger than an for all n greater than or equal to one by induction. So in order to use induction, we need a base case. So our base case will be to show that this is true for n equals 1, our first one. Well, yeah, it's going to be true because the next term, a n plus 1, if n equals 1 is just a2, and that's definitely, well, that's equal to 4, which is definitely bigger than 2, which is equal to a1. So a2 is bigger than a1, so this is true for our base case. So let's use our Let's do our inductive step now. Our inductive step is to assume that it's true up until a certain number, and then show that that leads it to be true for the next number after that. So let's assume that it's true up until some number k. So it's true for n equals k. All right, let's see, so then we have a k plus 1 is greater than a k. That needs to be true. So we have to use this assumption to show that a k plus 2 will be bigger than a k plus 1, that it works for the next term. So how about we uh, try to manipulate this to try to get an a k plus 2 out of here? Well, we could probably do that by making it look like the next term. So let's add 6 to both sides. that's balanced so we don't have to worry about it. That's definitely going to be the equivalent in truth value to what we started with. So let's take half of both sides now. And I think that that's good because half of AK plus 6 is uh, literally just the next term, a k plus 1, and half of a k plus 1 plus 6 is the next term after that, which is just a k plus 2. So we've proven that this thing actually is increasing. So now let's prove that it's bounded. So now we want to show that uh, a n is less than 6 for all n. And we'll do that again by induction. Notice this will actually show that it's bounded because we already know that this thing is uh, bounded below because we're starting at 2 and we've proven that it's increasing. So there's no way that it could possibly be any lower than 2. So 2 is a lower bound. It's the little m in this case. So we're suggesting that the big M for the upper bound is 6, and that'll make it bounded, because if it's bounded above and below, it's a bounded sequence. And then we can use our monotonic sequence theorem. So again, we need a base case. So that'll be for n equals 1. Well, then we have a1 is 2, which is definitely smaller than 6. So now let's assume, using our inductive step, we'll assume that uh, a n is less than 6. So we'll assume that that's true up until some number k. So assume true for n equals k. 
So that means that AK is less than 6 is what we're assuming. We need to show that AK plus 1 is also less than 6. So again, we transform this and to try to make it into the next term. So we add 6 to both sides. We get that AK plus 6 is less than 12. We'll take half of both sides now. So this will be less than half of 12, which is 6. So we got half of AK plus 6 is also going to be less than 6. So that's literally AK plus 1 by definition. So AK plus 1 is less than 6, so we've proved that this thing is bounded. So now that we've shown that this thing is uh, bounded and it's monotonic because it's increasing, monotonic is increasing or decreasing, so that means that it must converge. So because it must converge, we have that this, these two facts imply that the limit L of this uh, sequence AN must exist. Now that we know that the limit exists, we can just start playing around with it. We can write that the limit of uh, a n plus 1 is equal to the limit of half of a n plus 6 which is half of the limit of a n plus 6. We can pull out the half and this limit we're saying exists and is equal to L. So this will be half of L plus 6. But the limit of an plus 1, it shouldn't matter what term I start at, all the terms are approaching the same limit. So this limit must also be equal to L. So that means that we have L equal to half of L plus 6. So we multiply both sides by 2, we get 2L equals L plus 6. That means that L must be 6, solving for L. So we have shown that our limit is in fact 6 of the sequence.